Good morning. morning. Happy Easter to each one of you. I don't know about you, but I love to hear people's stories. Anybody else love to hear? Because everybody has a story, right? Look to your neighbor right now. I know it's early in the morning, but just say to each other, everybody has a story. Good. It's going to help you learn how to talk in church. That's, that's, That's a good thing. And some of you, as you're sitting next to each other, you know each other's story. Some of you are like, well, I know part of your story. But if you like to take notes, you can even start right here. Everybody has a story. You and I both have stories. And some people's stories are, are kind of like a river that just meanders, you know, just kind of has some twists and turns. Other people's stories are like the Niagara River. And there's cauldrons and there's rapids and there's waterfalls and it's crazy. And some people's stories are up and down and the unexpected happens and you're like, whoa. Because see, you can never just look at somebody and know their story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some things up on the screen that is true about several people. I mean, there's bits and pieces of, of what I'm going to put on the screen that are true for several people in our church. And some of them are also true of me. And you know, there's a lot of you that maybe are here for the first time. I don't know you. You don't know me. But we both have stories. And I want to put these up on the screen. You just try to guess what one of these are true about me. Okay? So these are true for a lot of different people here in our church. Born in Ohio. That's, yeah, that's, you think that happened to me? Yeah, it did. I'll just let you know. Played college basketball. Overdosed on drugs. Went to seminary. You know, all these things. So what do you think? How many of these do you think actually happened to me? I'll circle those that, want, that are. Ready? <laughs> all, all of them. But by the way, um, this was not last night, overdose on drugs. And this also, just so you know, is in, in the past. So I don't want anybody coming up to me afterwards. Okay, so, so you know, these are, these are things about my past, okay? But this one here is the one that I'm might be the most surprised. I, I pretended to be Easter Bunny. Not like Pastor Ben Folks you know, in our church who dresses up you know, to be anything, but no, apparently when I was like six or seven, there's this picture floating around in our family, and no, I'm not going to put it up on the screen, although I, we looked for it, but there's this picture of me when I was six or seven, and I'm kneeling on the ground, and I am dressed like an Easter bunny. I've got, it's homemade, you know, the ears and whiskers and everything. And, and I, look at that, I looked at that picture, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing? Because not only am I kneeled, kneeling down, but I've got my hands like this. And there's a story behind that me kneeling down. Like a, and I don't know whether I'm praying to the Easter bunny or whether I'm praying to be the Easter Bunny. I guess I really don't even know if I'm praying. I don't, maybe I'm trying to strike a pose of what I think a bunny does. I don't know. I, oh, we have the picture, but we don't know what I'm actually doing in the picture. And uh, at that age, who, who, who knows what's going through the mind of a six-year-old boy, right? Because there's a lot of six-year-olds who still think, I don't know, maybe not six. Maybe there's some 56-year-olds who still think Easter is about the Easter bunny. But we understand it's not, right? Okay, only a few of you. All right, that's why I need to preach this morning because the, the the, the story of Easter is not the story of the Easter bunny. People like to celebrate whatever the Easter bunny means. I don't even know. How did that get connected to Easter? I don't even know. But I know Easter is the very best part of the story of Jesus. It's not just part. It's the very best part of the story of Jesus. Because you know why we're here. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what Easter means. Even the word Easter is, comes from the old German word, which means uh, east, and it means sunrise. Because the Bible says at sunrise, the tomb that was sealed, where Jesus' dead body laid, because the story of Jesus includes him dying on a cross, being placed in a tomb, this great teacher, this great rabbi, this great friend, this great healer, this great person everybody loved, the religious leaders in the Romans crucified him, put him in a tomb, sealed the tomb, and that was the end of the story. But no, no, no. It's, 
we know that, that Jesus has a story that goes beyond the tomb, amen? He was raised on the third day, and that's why we celebrate Easter. At sunrise, as the sun was coming up over the east, people came to the tomb not expecting it to be empty, and it was empty because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And, and I don't know if you know this, but his disciples, Jesus' disciples, never got over that. I mean, Jesus had told them this was going to happen, but they didn't understand because people don't rise from the dead. And furthermore, um, they never expected Jesus to die. And so when he did, it just crushed them. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, it released something inside of the disciples. And, and all of a sudden, things Jesus said begin to make sense. And they're like, oh yeah, I remember that. And years later, I mean, 30, 40, 50 years later, they're still telling the story of Jesus to everyone they met. And they're writing books about it and writing letters to people. In fact, we have a letter. It's in your New Testament from the letter, letter called First Peter, where Peter wrote this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As an old man, as an old man, Peter is still using exclamation points. He's still jacked. He's still stoked about what happened to his friend Jesus and how he was raised from the dead. And this letter that he wrote is it's not something that Peter wrote because he heard about it. He's not telling the story of Jesus as if it's some kind of a bedtime story. It's not a story that he heard somewhere. It's the story of Jesus' life intersecting Peter's life and changing his story forever because not only does Jesus have a story, Peter has a story. And Jesus changed his life because life for just about everybody is full of the unexpected and that is exactly what happened in the story of Peter. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the story of Peter, the guy who wrote that letter we just quoted, who's all excited years later about what Jesus did. We know more about Peter's story than any other disciple. I don't know if that was on purpose, that the Holy Spirit wanted us to know more about Peter, or, or he was just a big fig, such a big figure that everybody wrote about him, but we know where Peter was born, in the town of Bethsaida, and I've been there in that little town. We, we know that Peter was a fisherman, that he and his brother Andrew were out fishing one day with their partners, James and John. All this stuff is in the Bible. It's in the Gospels. And we know that Jesus came and taught and uh, standing on the shore. One time he, he taught in a boat, Peter's boat. So Peter heard Jesus teach for, we don't know, months heard Jesus tell stories, held, heard Jesus preach, and he saw Jesus do miracles, and something's happening in Peter's life, but he never expected the day, because life is full of the unexpected. He never expected the day when Jesus would say to him, hey, Peter, leave what you're doing and follow me. And after all Peter had heard, after all he had seen, it just seemed like this is the only thing that makes sense. So he left everything, left his fishing business in the city of Capernaum. This is a picture of Capernaum today, right on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, here's the, an old synagogue there. Um, here is the, some of the remains of the city. I've, again, walked through here. This kind of a spaceship-looking thing <laughs> is a modern-day church that's built over this house where they found some artifacts and, and things that indicate this was the house of Peter because this is where he lived in Capernaum. This is where his fishing business came out of. And that is where one of the very first churches in the house of Peter was because Peter not, never got over the resurrection of Jesus. And I've walked along the shore of the Sea of Galilee with, with some of you, actually. 
And we've walked along the very shores where Jesus called Peter. And Peter followed. And Peter heard amazing things. And the, the more Peter spent time with Jesus, two things happened. The more he spent time with Jesus, the more impressed he was with, with Jesus, what he said, what he did, the healings. We know that Peter had a mother-in-law because one of the stories from the Gospel of Luke, before, before Jesus called Peter, the Bible tells us that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law from a fever about which she was to die. But he, he raised her up before she died. She was, and Peter saw this. He experienced this. It was his own mother-in-law. I don't know whether he was praying for his mother-in-law to be healed or not. But, you know, Jesus likes mother-in-laws. And so he's, he's, he, he heals her. Peter is experiencing all this, hearing all this. And the more he spends time with Jesus, the more impressed he is. Second thing, the more Peter spent time with Jesus, the more he realized, whoa, whoa, this guy is not just a special man. He's not just a great rabbi. He's not just a great prophet because the Jews honored prophets. Peter began to realize this Jesus, he's the one. So the Bible tells us that Peter was the very first one to recognize, to understand that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And actually in Matthew 16, Jesus says, you know, who do you say I am, disciples? And, and Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Now, when we hear that today, it's not maybe a big a deal as it was in the first century. You gotta understand, in the first century, everybody in Israel is pining, waiting with anticipation for the Messiah. And the idea that he would be called the son of the living God is mind-boggling. And when you heard the word Messiah, Christ, anointed one, you're, you're, you would get all excited because the, the prospect of you being alive when Messiah came was mind-boggling because the Messiah was going to restore Israel to power. I mean, there were so many hopes and dreams caught up in the word and the idea of Messiah. So when Peter says, you are the Messiah, he is full of hope. And I just want to explain this a little bit to you, help you see the, the kinds of things that Peter had hopes for. He had hopes for seeing Jesus. This isn't in your notes, so you just kind of listen. He had hopes for seeing Jesus being crowned as the king. Come on, think about that. King of Israel. And because he is hanging out with Jesus, he's going to see Jesus in the flesh, usher in the kingdom of God. And Peter's going to be one of Jesus' right-hand men. Maybe the right-hand man right there where the king of Israel, who's not just king of Israel, but they believe that Israel will be restored to prominence in the whole world. So he's like king of the world. This is the hopes that Peter had in Jesus and that Peter's going to be right there and it's going to restore Israel to this prominence. And all of Jesus' friends, the, the, the 12, Peter, the leader of them, they're all going to have places in the cabinet, in the kingdom. They're all going to have roles. <laughs> and Peter would dream about this. His hopes, every time Jesus said something, every time he healed somebody, every time he did something that was exciting, Peter was like, oh yeah, he's the one, he's the one. And his hopes just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the hope of just being with Jesus for the rest of his life was huge. Because Peter, he, he never kind of got used to the fact that Jesus chose him but he did and he would re he would remember that day when Jesus said Peter follow me and Peter's hopes are so full Jesus brought Peter hope and it filled his life it gave his life meaning and, and he was so excited until listen carefully Jesus let Peter down. And did you just, you're saying, did, did I just hear him say, I, I see some people furl, furl brows. Good, good, you're, you're, you're tracking with me. Did you say Jesus let Peter down? I did. Peter's hopes and dreams were just so elevated, but Jesus let Peter down. And you think to yourself, how could that happen? Oh, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. All the time, people put their hope in Jesus. 
And he lets them down. And some of you are like, Kid, this, is, this can't be right. This is not an Easter sermon. Surely that's a typo. No, that's, I, I typed it myself. This is what I meant to type. That people put their hope in Jesus all the time. And he lets them down. And that's what happened to Peter. All of his hopes and dreams Now, let me say it again with different emphasis. All of his hopes and his dreams. Here is the subtle thing that happens. It still happens today. People hear a little bit about Jesus. They might even read the Bible. And they see him do things and they're like, Woo, I I think I could kind of use some of that Jesus in my life. We take a little bit of Jesus here and then we hear somebody preach on TV and they, they got beautiful teeth and perfect hair and we're just like, wow, they must be, you know, they must know everything. And so we believe everything they say about Jesus and we spur a little bit of that and a little bit of this and we manufacture our own Jesus. We manufacture our own idea of what Jesus is going to do for us. He's going to bring us success. He's going to help us achieve all of our hopes and our dreams. This is what Peter did. He stopped listening to everything Jesus said and just began to be selective. And every time he heard something about or from Jesus that fit his hopes and dreams, he's like, ooh, I love that part of Jesus. Ooh, and conveniently stopped listening and ignored the parts where Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me must take up the cross and die daily. Oh, I, 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 I didn't even hear him say that because I don't like that part of Jesus. But the more Jesus talked, the more Peter kept hearing this stuff about death. And in fact, he even said that he was gonna die. And Peter's like, that can't happen. And it, it hurt Peter when Jesus When Jesus let Peter down, it hurt Peter. And I see this happen all the time. People put their hope in Jesus and he lets them down. And then when their version of Jesus, not the biblical Jesus, their version of Jesus, when he doesn't do what they want him to do, like some sort of genie, then they bail. Jesus hurts them. Jesus lets them down. See, we treat Jesus like he's some kind of golden corral buffet. And we go in and we're like, oh man, it smells so good. All these great, oh, I want some of that, and I want some of that, and oh, I want a lot of that. But, you know, we politely decline those things on the menu that we don't want. Nobody thinks bad for, of us because it's, it's, a, it's a buffet. We're we have a golden corral, Jesus. And I mean, this is true for a lot of you. You've got a golden corral, Jesus, who is the Jesus of your own. I'll have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Ooh, I want a lot of this. This is, this is good Jesus stuff. And we just pass over the stuff we don't like or that we don't understand or that we don't think is important. And we manufacture our own Jesus and we manage our own image of Jesus. And there are millions, now this is crazy, there are millions of people, some of you sitting here right today, who the Jesus you say you love is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's it's some kind of a collage. It's some kind of a golden corral Jesus that you've manufactured and kind of put on your plate for yourself. And that Jesus will let you down because that is not the real Jesus. And when you you read Peter's story, in fact, let me just take you to some, some places in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 16, you can start seeing Peter managing, manufacturing his own Jesus. Why? Because of his hopes and dreams about what a Messiah is supposed to do, what Peter was doing then, we still do today. So, I told you that Jesus kept saying things like, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. I'm going to get betrayed, handed over to the leaders, and they're going to to crucify me. One time, Jesus said this, and Peter goes, oh, no. And he takes Jesus aside. Have you ever noticed these words before? And Peter began to rebuke him. Who's him? Say out loud. Who's him? (laughs) Peter's rebuking Jesus? I mean, the, the nerve. I thought Peter was following Jesus. 
But when you manufacture your own Jesus and he doesn't come through like you want him to, you find yourself doing the most unimaginable things. <laughs> Never. Uh, th th these words don't go together. Never, Lord. See, if he's Lord, then you don't say no. You don't say never. You say yes, Lord. But this is the kind of stuff you say when you have your own version of Jesus. And he says, this will never happen to you. And Jesus won't stand for that then or now. Jesus won't let you turn him into your little genie. He, he's not going to let you put him in a little box. And he says to Peter, get behind me. You're not the leader here. You are not taking me off course. And then he adds these words. You don't have in mind the concerns of God. You've got your own hopes and dreams and you're trying to fit me into them. You've got only the concerns of yourself in mind. Peter, whew. Did anybody else hear Jesus just say that to me? I, I, ouch. It's awkward. But Peter's pretty resilient. He got over it because it just seems like a couple days later, we're back on track. You know, Jesus just needs to be managed. Sometimes Jesus gets a little, I don't know, talking about death. And we don't, nobody needs a Messiah that dies. So a couple days later, things get back on track for Peter because Jesus comes into Jerusalem and says to his guys, hey, get me a foal, F-O-A-L, of a donkey because the Bible says that the king of Israel will come riding into Jerusalem on a foal of a donkey. There's just this prophecy, and sure enough, that's what happens. And John records it. All four gospel writers tell the story, and people took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in these words, Blessed is the king of Israel. And Peter's beside himself. <laughs> yeah. Now this, now we're back on track. And there's joy that just sweeps over Peter because now he's back to the Jesus he's all excited about. Back to the Jesus that we want. And that's back to the Jesus who's going to be the king of Israel. That means I'm going to be on his court. Back to the real thing. Okay, Jesus, you got off track a little bit there, but I'm so glad you're back. Because we, after we're done here, man, we need to go into the temple. And then in the, after the temple, we need to go into Herod's palace and kick some Roman butt. We got some plans here, Jesus. Let's go. And sure enough, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that after Jesus came into Jerusalem with this parade, this is, this is, by the way, last Sunday, Palm Sunday, after this parade, Jesus goes into the temple just like Peter's got it figured out, and he starts throwing out the rip-off artists because there's always religious rip-off artists. He starts throwing them out of the, the temple and says, get out of here. And he yells, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. And Peter's doing a jig. He is so excited about this Jesus. It's like, whoo, come on, Jesus. Now let's go to Herod's palace, better, Caesar's palace. Let's go do some gambling here. We're, this is going awesome. But the Bible says that Jesus turned around and left. What? See, this is the problem with Jesus. He doesn't realize the moment. I mean, everybody is here in Jerusalem for the Passover. This is the moment. Come on, Jesus. You see what Peter's doing? He's trying to manage Jesus. He's trying to get Jesus to do what he wants, his hopes, his dreams. It's subtle. You and I, we do this all the time. If you say you love Jesus, let me just ask you a question. What Jesus? The Jesus of the Bible? The whole Bible? Or just bits and pieces? See, we have a dangerous thing happening in the world today, especially in America, it's called biblical illiteracy. That is, people don't know their Bibles. And they just hear a little bit from this preacher and a little bit on that blog and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and they manufacture their own Jesus. And it's not a small thing because the Jesus of your making cannot save you. <laughs> you can't make up your own Jesus. And he will let you down, just like he did 
for Peter. Look at this next verse. Because many of you know the story. Right? Let's just catch you up. That A couple days later, they had this thing called the Passover meal. That's where they celebrate the historic deliverance of the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and the Exodus. And they celebrate this meal every year. It's one of the high points of the, of the Jewish life. And they're having this Passover. It's supposed to be a, a fun time. But Jesus... Jesus is different this Passover. Something, this fact, this whole week, we now call Holy Week, they didn't figure out, but Jesus is, he's, he's different. He's got a, there's a tone to his voice and the Lord's, the, the Passover just goes different and after it's over, they go into the Garden of Gethsemane and some of you know the story that Judas there betrays him and he's arre- Jesus is arrested and in a matter of hours, Jesus is being beaten and falsely tried and he's headed for the cross. And Peter's hiding from a distance and a little servant girl comes up to him and says, hey, I've seen you with that Jesus guy. And Peter's like, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Second time, another servant girl saw him and said to the people, hey, this guy, I've seen him with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter goes, no, I don't know the man. And just like Jesus prophesied, a third time, someone says, I've seen you. I, your accent gives you away. I know who you are. You're one of those Jesus guys. And the Bible says that Peter called down curses on himself and swore and said, I don't know the man. A rooster crowed in the distance, just like Jesus said. And in a matter of hours, Jesus was dead. Dead. No, dead. And Peter realized that things are out of control here. The Bible says that he went out and wept bitterly. See, all of our stories are full of the unexpected, full of hope and hurt, joy and grief, because we don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes when we get a little bit of religion or a little bit of Jesus, we create our own false hopes. But this is not in your notes, but write down this phrase, false hopes equal dead hope. Peter's dream and hope about him being in the ruling kingdom of God, him seeing Jesus be king of Israel on the throne in Jerusalem, all those hopes, they're dead hopes now. Because when Jesus died on the cross, all of Peter's hopes died. It's hard for us to imagine how devastated Peter was, how devastated the disciples because when you have a hope that's been fueled and fueled and pumped and pumped and then it dies and there's no coming back that is a devastating loss and some people never get over it false hopes are dead hopes today (laughs) there's all i mean i could fill this screen here's just a few people put their hope in their own hard work They put their hope in money, other people, their education, their own intelligence and ability, the stock market, religion, trying to be good. If I just do enough good things, you know, that's that's what that's my hope. Or the one I've been talking about today, a Jesus of their own making. All of these are false hopes. All these are dead hopes. Now listen carefully, because this fits with the phrase, people put their hope in Jesus and he lets them down. Jesus will let our false hopes die because there really is no hope at all if it's a dead hope. He will let our false hopes die. Why? So he can give us living hope. Let's go back to that verse now. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a what? What kind of hope? Is it a dead hope? Is it a false hope? No, it's a, a living hope because Peter is telling his story here. This is his story. I had hopes, but I realized that they were wrong. They were my own manufacturing, and I, I didn't realize that my hopes were actually my hopes. And Jesus mercifully let my hopes die because they're false hopes, and I would rather find that out now than at the end of my life. He will let our false hopes die so he can give us a living hope because everybody's stories need some living hope. Amen? 
Come on. Everybody's stories mean the worst possible thing. The worst possible thing is for you to live your whole life and get to the end of your life and realize what you hoped in was wrong, was false, was a dead hope. What you need is living hope that will outlive this world. Friends, without Jesus, the Bible's Jesus, the, the biblical Jesus, we are in so much trouble. And that's why we have preachers to, to tell us the good news of Jesus Christ and the, the new birth into the living hope that he wants to give us because that's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead gives us. That's what we're here to celebrate because everybody has a story. And I want so desperately for every one of your stories to experience living hope. In fact, I heard a story a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago that just was so captivating that I wanted you to hear it. And the, the people I'm going to show you in this video, they, wanna, they have a message that they want to tell you about how they discovered living hope. In fact, the story's too big for us to tell today, so we're gonna just tell part of it. It's a couple named Jack and Kathy, and we're gonna just hear part of Kathy's story today, and you're gonna have to come back another day to hear the rest of Jack's story, because it's mind-boggling. Just give you a little hint. Jack was an atheist, I mean like a flaming atheist. Didn't believe there even was a God, let alone that he was Jesus Christ who died on the cross for his sins and was raised from the dead to pay the penalty for No, he, he never could imagine that, but that's another story. Let me hear the story together of the message of Jack and Kathy. I don't have things like Jack where I can recite a series of events that occurred. You know, as a young, as a young woman, I made lots of mistakes, and I never forgave myself for doing that. And I was brought up, my parents said, go to church, but they didn't go to church. Um, never read a Bible. Um, never understood that I can be forgiven for the things that I did. So for about, well, I'm 57, so for about 35 years, I've lived with shame and guilt. And what I want to get out there is that I finally understand. I finally am reading the Bible. I finally understand that I am still loved. By more than me. <laughs> you know, I am a child of God. And um, Amen. Jesus died for me. What I want to do is Thank God for allowing me to live. I could have died multiple times. And allowing me to get to the point where I am today, where I'm in a loving relationship, forgiven by you, forgiven by God. There is forgiveness in the world. And if they understand Jesus, they know that's what it's all about. You can you can be forgiven and you can live a fulfilled life. Kathy and I lived fast and furious for a long time, not together. We didn't know each other until seven years ago. And we made a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes at times could have cost each one of us our lives. We did things that were very sinful um, and if we can be forgiven, everybody out there, if you say yes to Jesus, you too will be forgiven. I think that's our message. That's our message. I like it. <laughs> I love their story because it's so typical of people who are just kind of bouncing through life. And they may realize they have no hope, or they may have manufactured some hopes, but they're not experiencing the, the living hope. And Jesus, just like with Peter, and just like with me, 
Jesus' story interrupted their story. And they experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for their sins, for their doing their own thing, following their own hopes and dreams, and thinking that it's their life, they can do whatever they want with it. But no, we come to the realization that we're here on this earth for the glory of God, not for the glory of us. This is a rude awakening for people. Our life, we're taught that it's all about us. But that's not what you're here for. You're here for the glory of God. And the only way you can do that is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And when I tell people this sometimes, they're like, oh, that sounds really good. But this living hope you're talking about, I think that's great for you. I'm so glad for you. But you don't know what I've done. I hear this all the time. You don't know what I've done. I've, I've hated God. I've rejected him. I, in fact, I used to follow God. I used to believe in Jesus, but then he let me down and I cursed him and I left the church and I left God. Or you know, there's a thousand different versions of people saying, I've, I've gone too far, but we've forgotten two great words in this verse that Peter experienced, the great mercy of God. A guy named Paul, St. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, because God is rich in mercy. He pours out his love and his grace on on us. And, And even though we're dead in our trespasses and sins, he makes us alive in Christ Jesus. This great mercy is for anyone who has committed great sin. That would be me, by the way, and you. See, there's no sin that you can commit that God's great mercy cannot overcome. Hallelujah. There's nothing you can do that somehow causes God to go, oh, 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 I didn't anticipate that. Whoa. You know, the cross does not cover that sin. Oh, guys, Peter experienced the great mercy of God. (laughs) And he experienced what everybody needs to experience The great mercy of God that gives us new birth. That means a new start. That means I get to have a do-over. Begin again. A new start, a new chance. That's what new birth is about. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Everybody's stories need a resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it doesn't matter what your story has been said, has been told so far. Because Jesus wants to write a new chapter in your story. Your your story's not over yet. Come on. What do you think you're doing here today? You didn't realize it, but Jesus' story has been on a trajectory to interrupt your story, just like Peter. And there's another chapter or two or three or ten to be written in your story. What do you say? Like Peter, you want to stop putting your hope in things that are dead hope? Let those hopes die so Jesus can give you a living hope because that's what he wants to do. He wants to give. It's not something you earn. You don't get the living hope because you came to church on Easter Sunday. You receive this living hope because you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And he wants to give you that living hope. And this kind of hope is an unstoppable hope. It's the kind of hope that will sustain you through no matter what happens in your life. Putting your hope in Jesus Christ and him alone. And so next week I'm going to start a new series called Unstoppable Hope. And we're going to hear some more stories about some people's lives who experienced incredible crisis and difficulty, and they experienced living an unstoppable hope. And friends, you need this, and I do too. Our marriages need unstoppable hope. Our families, our society, we need some hope that's living and unstoppable, and it can start right now. I'm going to put a prayer up here on the screen, and I want you to see this. I want you to see this because I want you to know what you're about to pray. And I'm praying that all over our campuses, people will pray this prayer. 
that I need your great, I need your great mercy today. And I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I'm turning, this is what you're saying by this prayer. I'm turning my way from my way to follow the way of Jesus right now. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. This is what you're praying. This is what you're believing. This is what you're saying. Lord, I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your love and your grace and your Holy Spirit. I'm putting my hope in the biblical Jesus, the real Jesus right now. I'd love to see the hands of people who are praying that prayer. So here's what I want everybody to do. Either close your eyes now that you've seen the prayer and let me pray it and you pray it with me or just keep your eyes open and just pray this prayer as I pray. Pray with me. And if this is the first time you've ever prayed this, I'm going to ask you to just slip your hand up. And why, might somebody see you? Amen. Might somebody see you? Hey, great. <laughs> you are going to follow Jesus and you can't do it in the dark. You can't do it in hiding. So, Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, say it out loud with me. Lord, I need your great mercy today. I admit I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Come on, pray with me. I'm turning from my way to follow the way of Jesus right now. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. Lord, I need you. Forgive my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm putting my hope in you, Jesus, the real Jesus. Can I just see, is anybody hands up? A little bit of light here. Okay, I see a couple hands. A little bit of light here so I can see the hands. A little more light, please. Amen. I, just, I want to keep our hands up. I want to pray for you. In all of our campuses, there will be a campus pastor watching, okay? Please keep your hands up. This is great. I want to see you because I want to pray for you. Yes. Cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. Okay, now let's all just stand to our feet. And Father, we thank you. In every campus, we thank you right now for what you've done. And all of us here say, I want to follow you, Jesus. Because I need you. I need you, Jesus. For we pray in your name, amen.